Hi, this is your host Sapni Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFLS Talk, uh, KubeCon special. And today we have with us once again, Julian Fisher, founder and CEO of N9 Junior. It's great to have you on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here again. You met at KubeCon in Valencia and KubeCon is all, almost here. So first of all, let's talk about what kind of presence we can expect of N9 at this upcoming KubeCon in Detroit. Yeah, we're actually uh, going there with uh, two of our team members from the Kubernetes teams. Um, so we're expecting a lot of fun. Uh, it's the first international conferences we're doing since uh, Corona um, and are very looking forward to this. Also a new city to explore. So there's going to be uh, a lot of a lot of fun, I guess. Talk a bit about what kind of talks uh, you will be deliver. You folks will be delivering. You know, I am aware of you know, data on Kubernetes and other. So let's talk about you know uh, the sessions you'll be participating in. This time it's actually me in person. Um, I'm giving two talks. One at the data on Kubernetes um, event that's co-located with KubeCon, um, and it's about um, building. Uh, Kub, you know, automation for running Postgres across multiple Kubernetes clusters with the idea to cover multiple infrastructure regions, uh, for example, to span a database globally. The other talk is, um, to, uh, you know, basically a recap of working uh, with Cloud Foundry for more than 10 years now. Um, so that, that'll be the two talks. And I'm I'm happy to you know, share some some of the details with you. Yeah, let's talk about you know the the recap of ten years of you know your you know work with the the Cloud Foundry community. Talk about that. J just give us a teaser about the talk. When we started working with Cloud Foundry, uh, we've been a, a Ruby on Rails development shop. Um, we we did um, software operations as well, but um, you know the journey from getting in touch with Cloud Foundry to becoming any nines company was was called Avatech back in the days is a transformation story um, along the way trans the transformation not only uh, you know happened and affected our company but also cloud foundry itself so cloud foundry has been in under constant change um, since then and the talk will be about you know how the technology changes um, how it did in the past and whatever will be in the future. But it's also about how our company changed along with it and how it felt to be uh, you know, a mid-sized company uh, in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem. I will also share some of the impressions we got from the community, you know, the friends we made along the way and, and, and how, how great it is to be in that ecosystem. Uh, to this day. And that's a very, you know, kind of warm and closely knit community there when we do look at uh, Cloud Foundry. Now, since we're talking about Cloud Foundry, uh, they will be also, you know, uh, talking a lot about uh, a lot of projects that are kind of either bridging the gap. As we were talking earlier, a lot of classic Cloud Foundry users there who are seeing Cloud Foundry, a lot of folks are looking at moving to Kubernetes. So there's a project called Kurifi that they will be talking about. Uh, talk a bit about the project. How do you see the project and what do you expect from that? And how does it help uh, folks like any nines? Well, we've seen a lot of adoption um, towards Cloud Foundry in the past 10 years, especially from from large enterprises. So building operation, uh, building application development platforms at scale, that's something Cloud Foundry, especially classic Cloud Foundry is really, really great. And from the perspective of, of operational efficiencies, I, you know, I told that many times up to this day, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. In, and this is also because of the underlying mechanism, mechanism on how you deploy it using Bosch. All right, that's, that's a given thing. It still stands absolutely, um, let's say, 100% solid. Now, there's Kubernetes. And Kubernetes, you know, it's not just another thing that, um, that you can ignore. It's, it's something that you'll have to adapt with whatever software you have. So from the Cloud Foundry perspective, how to, you know, deliver that Cloud Foundry experience over, over the next 10 years something needed to change. And there have been many projects to do that, you know, like um, a kubectl and, and CF for Kubernetes. And I think they all share, you know, <laughs> the, the same trend, which is Kubernetes has much more weight and momentum than initially anticipated. So Corfi, in my opinion, is, you know, the, the um, manifestation of the insight that, 
that Kubernetes is is not only something that you need to provide somewhere within within it, but it's the very foundation to build future application development platforms. So the the rewrite, uh, the Corfi rewrite, is basically uh, you know paying tribute to that insight by adapting uh, Kubernetes technologies you know from ground up. So the the way you deploy applications will be much more Kubernetes native in Corfi than in Corfi with than with anything that was before. So that's definitely the future. Um, now we we have to say that you, you know technology like this always has two perspectives. The one is the application developer. Like yeah, there, there's Cloud Foundry, and uh, how does it feel for me to deploy an application? But there's also the um, the platform operator perspective, which is how do I operate this whole thing? How big can it be, and what are the operational efficiencies? So, I think uh, Corfi is still in in the making. So you know all the demos we are seeing now, it's it's pretty much you know focusing on on the perspective of application developers. And we, for example, at any nines, we are running those clusters you know I- internally to see and learn about the operational efficiencies and to uh, incorporate that into our any nines platform uh, when it's ready. And we are slowly getting there. It's, it's, you know, exciting to see Corify to, to, to prosper. Um, so I'm very looking forward to, uh, to seeing that thing in action. I quickly want to talk about Kubernetes itself because uh, I have been seeing this discussion a lot recently even in my interviews and the pain points are two. One, one number one is the complexity that comes with Kubernetes and second thing is that it loose, leads to a lot of cost. There is already a, a talent crisis in the market. A lot of companies have started to realize that since you folks are doing a lot of work in the Kubernetes, how do you look at this problem and how is any nice kind of addressing it? Kubernetes is, for example, different from Cloud Foundry in that regard that it is very, very flexible. So um, whenever a technology can be configured and customized as much as Kubernetes can, you know, it's, it's, it's barely impossible to talk about Kubernetes in general. You always need to set some constraints and define a context for what are you doing with Kubernetes. So, for example, Kubernetes for a small company running all their workloads in a single Kubernetes cluster, that's a very different thing from, let's say, a large enterprise with 10,000 of application developers uh, where the trust relation between the individual business unit is different and you need to make sense of the operational efficiencies you know, across this sheer huge number of people. And, you know, at any nines, we... We've collected so much experience in helping large clients and, you know, at least medium-sized companies. So starting with a few, a few thousand employees, I'd say, when, when things, you know, can't be handled um, with, with a standard tooling anymore. So our goal is to automate 100% of the uh, application development lifecycle. In the sense that you know developers write their application, but they don't need to care need to kick they don't need to care about running databases or deploying their applications uh, manually. It it must be automated. Now, if you think about Kubernetes in larger enterprises, and we've referred to that issue, you you're looking at a larger number of Kubernetes clusters spanning multiple infrastructures, often multiple regions of infrastructure. So, how do you make sense of that? in a meaningful way. For example, we've seen that def, uh, that GitOps uh, movement where you, you basically describe, you know, an entire distributed system, whether it's with or without uh, a Kubernetes cluster, and you basically check it into a Git repository, you push a button, and, you know, everything from there is handled for you. Now, taking that vision that you declaratively describe somehow, whether this is with, you know, you know, Git, Git uh, with YAML stored in a Git repository or some some other uh, means doesn't matter. But if you if you describe such a distributed system, and you would like to deploy that distributed system and carry it throughout the lifecycle, there are a lot of things you need to automate that are currently not automated at all. For example, this is managing the lifecycle of Kubernetes, including managing extensions that will extend Kubernetes, such as a service mesh, such as operators for storing data, or integrating other data solutions 
like the any nine state of services, for example, in a Kubernetes cluster in a meaningful way, so that running hundreds of Kubernetes clusters won't eat the operational efficiencies that you're actually aiming for. So this is the area where we are involved uh, a lot in making those operational efficiencies that we know from Cloud Foundry environments happen in Kubernetes while still allowing much more flexibility than with Cloud Foundry, the classic Cloud Foundry. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing that. Now, since we are talking about KubeCon and we are talking about Kubernetes, any specific announcements or, you know, uh, technologies that you will be showcasing at the KubeCon? We recently uh, published Postgres, uh, the Postgres operator for Kubernetes. So you know that we are, you know, involved in, in automating data services for a decade now, and that we are very strong in automating uh, also Postgres, among others, uh, based on virtual machine automation, with, uh, with um, you know, Bosch being uh, the, the declarative technology inside. Now, if you think about use cases with, with Kubernetes, you'd also see that there are some uh, platform environments where you know, the only uh, contract to infrastructure is that there is a Kubernetes cluster. So for people going all into Kubernetes, they also want to manage their data in Kubernetes. That's, that's why we're also so engaged in the data on Kubernetes community. So the idea, if you, if you remember that, that the n 9 data services, for example, from a, a commercial perspective, you, you purchase one license and you get access to all the data services across all your environments. This will also include the Postgres uh, operator for Kubernetes. So it's a seamless um, uh, you know, integration into the n platform. So the team has been working a lot of get in, you know, getting this uh, Postgres operator right because there are a lot of operators out there also for Postgres. But you need not only to get, for example, cluster management right, uh, regarding replication and so on, but you also need to think about how do you connect your application to a Postgres? So in Cloud Foundry, we know that there's a, a concept such as service bindings, and this is something we also transfer to the Kubernetes uh, world. So you can declare, uh, let's say, the relationship of an application to uh, to a database uh, using uh, a service binding uh, custom resource, which will then take care of creating you know, the database user creating the secret and so on. And the same idea applies to backups. So it's not some endpoint you call and then Postgres will create a backup for you, but it's something you declare. You declare, I want to have a backup of this database and, uh, and there are CRDs to express that and they will be reconciled in creating backups for you. So it's, it's basically taking our experience uh, from, from the N9 data services for virtual machines and transferring them to Kubernetes native uh, operators uh, to also provide exact those operational efficiencies that I earlier spoke of, which also incorporates how do you install the, the, the operator and how do you keep it up to date uh, if you're running hundreds of Kubernetes clusters. So the beta release of that product is, uh, is basically now happening. And you will be doing demos at your booth here? Yeah, sure. I mean, product can be used, can also be... Uh, you know, try it out. Um, we we offer uh, the ability to you know get hands on the operator, install it in your environment. We help you to get it going, and you know, uh, you know, try it out yourself. What kind of folks you know should come and check out your booth, and what they can expect there? Well, anybody interested in how do you build application developer platforms is welcome. Um, I mean, we cover from you know uh, application deployment using Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes. Uh, and, and other extensions, everything towards uh, deploying Kubernetes at scale, uh, deploying Kubernetes across infrastructures, and also, ob obviously, one of our famous topics is data service automation for both virtual machines and containers. So if, if, if that's something you're currently doing within your company and you would like to share some thoughts, just welcome, you're welcome to come over and have a chat. Can you also talk a bit about you know what other work, uh, what other research is going on, you know, at any lines, of course, in the context of Kubernetes? If you can share some insights and details there. We we talked about what you know the the, the challenges that uh, organizations face when they uh, cr create a number of Kubernetes clusters, and um, one of the challenges we see is for large clients, it is very likely that certain patterns, certain 
you know, let's say templates on how a Kubernetes cluster will look like uh, need to be used on a frequently basis. So for example, Corify. If you want to install Corify in Kubernetes and you would like to have, let's say, a dozen Corify clusters, how do you do that efficiently? Um, you know, we, we thought about um, managing the life cycle of Kubernetes extensions in a similar way than managing the life cycle of data services. So again, operational efficiencies is the main goal. Um, and we are uh, currently developing a solution that does the uh, management of, of, of stacks, which would be a, a template for a Kubernetes cluster ready to be used by application developers, which could include you know, some application layer, in, could be a Corify or Knative, uh, including a service mesh and some operator. So you'd be able to define your own combination of extensions and then deploy that declaratively, including lifecycle management down to monitoring and backups in an infrastructure agnostic way. So this will work on, on any major infrastructure and it'll give you that operational efficiency we're talking about. Julian, once again, thank you so much for sitting down with me and talk about you know your presence at uh, the upcoming KubeCon event. But I, will, you know, I look forward to talking to you and meeting you there in person as well. But I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Well, and thank you very much. Also looking forward to see you again, um, to see all of you again. So just come over. Uh, I'll be around um, and, and very looking forward to, to see people again at a real conference. So once again, thanks for having me and yeah, see you next time. <laughs>